You were the word at the beginning One with God the Lord most high You hid in glory and creation Now revealed in you are Christ What a beautiful name it is what a beautiful name it is the name of jesus christ my king what a beautiful name it is nothing compares to this what a beautiful name it is the name of jesus didn't want heaven without us so jesus you brought heaven down my sin was great your love was greater what could separate us now what a wonderful name it is what a wonderful name it is the name of jesus christ my king what a wonderful name it is nothing compares to this what a wonderful name it is the name of jesus what a wonderful name it is the name of Jesus We lift your name of God We exalt you Lord We exalt you Jesus There's no one in heaven or on earth that's like you, Jesus. You are worthy, Lord, of all our praise. You are worthy, Lord, so we sing. We lift you up. Death cannot hold. Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you, silence the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no equal, now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is, nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. You have no rival, you have no evil. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. 
Nothing can stand against What a powerful name it is The name of Jesus What a powerful name it is The name of Jesus What a powerful name it is The name of Jesus We exalt you, Lord What a powerful name it is, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is, nothing can stand against, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus.
Fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. Singing hallelujah. This is how I fight my battles. We sing. This is how I fight my battles. We fix our eyes on you, Lord. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. Sing it, babe, look. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you even now, God. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles. 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 This is how. Oh, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by. We believe it, Lord. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Help us to believe it, Jesus. It may look like 
like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles. 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 It may look like all we believe it. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Thank you, Jesus. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. Oh, we fix our eyes on you. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. It may look like oh, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. We believe it. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. Oh, I praise you and I trust you. In the midst of the storm, I trust you, Lord. In the midst of the storm, trust you, Lord. Trust you, Lord. Trust you. One more time. This is how I find my battles. This is how I find my battles. This is how I fight 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 my battles. One more time. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles.
Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, sing it again. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. You silence fear, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. In your name is a lie that the shadows can't deny. You name.
pray over us right now that the ultimate obliteration and defeat of the darkness will begin in us. The darkness that wraps its fingers around us. It's got no place with us. We are blood-bought sons and daughters of the Most High God. It's got no place with us. And you've got power. And you're standing in a place filled with power to obliterate the darkness that's got a hold of you and that's got a hold of me. So I want to pray over that um, this morning as we continue in our worship together. And if you'd like to receive this as a prayer over you, you can do that. So Father, with, with whatever spiritual authority I have as the leader of this small congregation on the west side of Nashville, God, I pray that you would defeat and obliterate the darkness that's got a hold of each of us in this room. Where there is depression, I pray that you would bring freedom. Freedom from depression, God. Where there is a spirit of resentment and revenge, deep-seated and rooted in the hearts of people, God, I pray that you would obliterate that darkness and that you would set people free from that prison of resentment and revenge. God, it's darkness. It is not you. And it imprisons us. Where there is anxiety and control, God, I pray that you would obliterate that darkness from all of those in this room. That anxiety would melt away, that we would no longer feel the need to control things. Because there's someone bigger than us that we can turn care and control of our life over to. His name is Jesus. It's the name of Jesus that lets our anxiety and control melt away. Where there is self-pity, God, I pray for that darkness to vanish. That it could be replaced with self-compassion and intimacy with other human beings who are trustworthy. Father God, where there is toxic shame and self-loathing, self-critique and self-judgment, I pray by the name of Jesus that darkness would evaporate, that it would lose its grip on people here. And that everyone in this room can learn to see themselves as the creative work of God made in his image as a son and as a daughter who have been gifted and invited and sent into his purpose and that the world needs them. In the name of Jesus, I pray against toxic shame, God. I pray against rage. It could be as subtle as sarcasm all the way through to demanding and uh, getting loud and big and intimidating people. God, I pray against the darkness of rage that sometimes can take root in our heart. And I pray that you would defeat it, God, that you would eradicate it and set people free from that, God. It is in the name of Jesus that this darkness that oppresses us can be defeated and removed permanently, God. And I ask in the name of Jesus, that it would be so, that it would start with us, and that you would build together a body of people here who gather, experience, and celebrate their freedom together, declare how dedicated and committed we are to the name of Jesus, to worshiping and giving our lives away to him, God, and then we move out of this place into the city driven by everything I do, I do it to the glory of God, to take ground in his name and to dissolve the darkness on this side of the city. God, we ask that you would do this through us to your glory and in your name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Nate. Thanks, Sarah. It's beautiful. Well, before you grab a seat, um, I want you to find someone you don't know and ask them this question. Do you prefer, like, maybe a couple weeks of, like, good snow or do you just want to get right to spring? Like, what's your preference? Give me a couple more weeks of snow to close out the winter, or I'm ready for 73 and cloudiness.
Someone you don't know, tell them that, and then you can grab your seat. All right. Well, good morning. If we haven't met yet, my name is Jake, and I serve as one of the pastors here. And I just want to say to like this crowd right here in the middle, special thanks to you, because normally it's vacuous right here for whatever reason. It's like we got the rainbow horseshoe thing going on typically. This feels awesome. So thank you. It's warm, it's cozy, and I feel much less lonely sitting here today. So thank you guys very much. Well, um, Again, my name is Jake. If we haven't met one of the pastors here, uh, we're going to be finishing our series, Fame and Deeds, today, which always makes me very sad. Um, so I'm going to delay it a little bit. Before we get to that, worship host, would you please come and prepare to receive the offering this morning? Now, as they're coming, we, we have several people who have chosen uh, to give um, by doing kind of that regular auto withdraw thing online, like you pay your electric bill or whatever, your cable. And um, I found out this week, we had two people who found out that the way they set it up, their giving's been going to Franklin. So you're welcome, Franklin. Um, But they changed that, and I just want to encourage you, if you happen to be someone who is choosing to give by doing that regular giving thing online, would you just check, like go into your profile you got to click the little drop-down thing where all our churches come up, and you, be sure you click Sylvan Park. Um, otherwise, you're being very generous um, to a different church, and that's great, too, but uh, maybe you mean, mean to do that. But if you intend to give here, be sure you check that out. Okay. Um, the past few weeks, I've been reflecting on the kind of culture I long for our church to have. Now, this isn't, I'm not talking about our vision. Our vision's... You know, see the families of God renewed in our day, and our mission is uh, we're a family of churches living in the way of Jesus for the renewal of the city. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about our culture, like when we gather up. Like when, when people walk into this place and they fill this room and they drop their kids off at Kid City and, and the kids in there, like, what, is that, what does that need to feel like? When you gather together for a small group that meets in a home during the week or a B women's workshop or whatever it is, an integration group, like when our people are represented in a circle, even not church related, in your business meeting or in a social gathering with your friends and neighbors, like what do we want the culture of Church of the City people to bring with it wherever it gathers, wherever it goes? I've been reflecting and praying a lot about this, and this is a statement that that I'm starting to lean into as a description of the kind of culture I long for us to have here. I want this to be a home for souls to rest and grow into God's purpose. I'm going to say it a little more slowly. What if this could become a home? We're all made for home. We're all longing for home. What if this place could become a home for souls to rest and grow? into God's purpose. So many of you financially invest in building this place. Um, I know some churches shy away from money. It takes money to build something. It takes money to be generous and change things in a community. Justice issues support great organizations that are doing awesome things for the under-resourced families that are all around us. This Cone School, the mentoring programs that we do. And so many of you are so faithful to invest financially in what we're trying to do so that we could become a place, uh, a home for souls to rest and grow. 
so that we can be a generous family in the greater community that we're a part of. So thank you for what you give. Okay, as our worship hosts receive the offering this morning, here's a couple of things I would like you to consider. Um, First are we've got a a couple of serving opportunities. Um, We've really started to grow as a church, which is exciting. Um, If if you've been here for a couple of weeks, you kind of look across the room, and um, each week there's a few less seats, and before you know it, we're going to have to start moving those curtains back, and before you know it, we're not going to need the curtains, and before you know it, we're going to have to, you know, be opening up the balcony, and and that's exciting. Our, our goal is not just to get big as a church. Our goal is to deeply form every individual person who brings themselves to this place deeply, like help bring out the fullness of who they were made to be and empower them and release them into the world. Um, driven by everything I do, I do it for the glory of God. That's what, that's what our hope is. Um, but we are also growing with people who are interested in that and who are taking steps uh, into becoming more committed and, and um, uh, taking advantage of the stuff we offer here. So along with that comes serving opportunities, more serving opportunities. So the big one is Kid City is really growing. Uh, we had over 40 kids in there last Sunday. I don't even know how many are in there today, but like we started off and it was like 12 kids and like one of them was fifth grade and an infant. You know, and it's like... What do you do with this? But now it's like, man, from there, it's like over 40 kids. We're pushing 50. Next thing you know, there's going to be 100 kids in there. So we got to keep that infrastructure up because we don't just do child care here. We don't want to do that. We want to be responsible to form and develop kids at the earliest stages. So all I need right now, you're going to hear this announcement a lot. I hope, that, I hope that I keep having to say we need more in Kids City. We need more in Kids City. But right now, we definitely need one more person for infants and toddlers Infants and toddlers, one person. I need three more people in the elementary school kind of age um, to kind of manage, love, and uh, kind of begin to lead those small groups. We'll teach you everything you need to know. And then I need three for the second service. So our Kids City team gets one weekend off a month, but the rest of the weekend, um, the rest of the Sundays, they're in there uh, doing what they do together. And the reason I felt okay asking them to do that and to forego this experience is because I said to them, if you're willing to pour your life and soul into our kids, I'll pour my life and soul into you. And did you know that me and Nate, every Sunday when we're done in here, walk down the hallway and we sit in a small group circle with the Kid City team. I teach them the exact same message that I just taught. Nate um, leads worship with us. It's a really connected, beautiful moment. And every week they're still getting this. And then once a weekend, I tell them to go to the lake or, you know, they can come in here if they want or whatever. They get that kind of weekend off to, to, to recharge. But I need three people that will be willing to watch the kids of the people serving down there most weeks for an hour while we do our second service. So one for infants and toddlers, three in the elementary school age, and three for the second service. If you're interested just in more information about that, you're like going, I'll explore that a little bit. That's all you're, you're doing by emailing her. Email Maddie Crandall. Uh, her e- email is mcrandall at churchofthecity.com. She's our Kid City Director. And uh, you can ask her whatever questions you have and talk to her a little bit more about that. Okay, we've got a baptism service coming up on March 17th, just here in a couple of weeks. If you have not taken uh, that important spiritual step in your life personally and you feel, you're feeling stirred, you're feeling like you might be ready for that initiating rite of the church, just email me, jake at churchofthecity.com. I'd love to talk to you a little bit about that. Sometimes people have questions about that before they go through. Uh, you know, I was baptized as a baby. Is that, you know, is that kind of check the box? Or like, what, you know, what's going on there? And I'd love to have that conversation with you or any other questions you have if you're interested and feel that stirring in you. So that's uh, on March the 17th. Now, I will say adult baptism doesn't have to have been here, but adult baptism is one of the requirements that we as a church have for membership which is what we call being a stakeholder. Um, The next stakeholders course is going to be on Sunday, March the 24th. It's a 1 o'clock to 5 o'clock p.m. experience, and it's don't imagine like sitting in a classroom lecture for that long. It's very connective, very relational, lots of breaks. We have food, um, super relaxed, living room type uh, situation. You get to meet and engage with a lot of people. It's a really fun time. I really look forward to the stakeholders when we do it. But the next opportunity is on March 24th. You have to go through that course to become a stakeholder. We'll talk about what we believe as a church. We'll talk about our mission, our vision, our values, um, and answer any questions that you have so that you've got all the information you need to make that decision. If you're thinking of doing that and you haven't been baptized as an adult yet, um, 
maybe you want to be baptized on March 17th and then come to stakeholders on March 24th and then you'll be ready to go through the stakeholder ceremony that's coming up shortly after that. So there you go. Okay. As I said in the beginning, it's always sad for me when we close out a series and I don't take closing out a series lightly. We really feel like these series are are led by the Holy Spirit. Like, we're not strategically just sitting around going, what would be a good series to do? You know, this would be cool. Like, we could create a cool brand around this one. Like, we pray and say, God, what word do you have for your people? And so, um, man, when it comes to an end, it's like, man, it's, that's big for me. I don't take it lightly. So today, I've brought in a ringer um, to close this out. Does that exist in Bible teaching? Can you have a ringer in Bible teaching? If that does exist, her name is Christy McClellan. I'll tell you that much. Like, she's such a ringer that she actually asked me today, like, hey, do you have, a, like, a laser pointer? I was like, no, Christy, I don't have a laser pointer. She's like, oh, wait, uh, I got one. As you do, just carry your laser pointer in case you're going to break out in Bible teaching somewhere unexpected. So Christy's one of the more gifted Bible teachers I've had the pleasure to know personally. What I love about Christy is that while she is academically brilliant, her teaching is so much more than academic. She teaches from her heart. And Christy, I'm honored to be able to sit underneath your gifting this morning. This is the last time she's going to be with her church family before she leads her next trip to Israel, because she does that several times a year. And so um, not only are we closing out our series, we're closing out a stint for you here at home until you go and perform another part of your calling that God's called you to, so we're glad you're here. So before she comes, I'll be reading the passage she's going to teach us from today. Would you please stand in the honor of the reading of the word? This is Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John, and then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm so glad. I'm really honored just to get to be with another part of the Church of the City family this morning. As Jake mentioned, I'll be flying out Saturday to go spend a month in the Holy Land with our next two teams. And I woke up this morning um, around 5 a.m. I'm a morning person, and the Lord just gave me a, a quieted morning. And I was sipping my coffee. It was around 5.30. I was sitting on my front porch. Chester was running around outside. And I just felt this invitation from the Lord to really pray for our time today. I don't know if you've noticed, we've been getting a little bit of rain um, here in the area lately. And uh, in the Middle East, um, they are a people who need rain. And any time it rains, a day when there's rain in Israel, they call it a twice-blessed day. And I just woke up this morning to the rain, and I'm like, Lord, would you let it be a twice-blessed day for us as we come together as the family of God, as the people of God. And I've just been asking him this morning to meet you and to meet me. We are not orphans, and we are not the fatherless. Um, There is a table of welcome that the living God is setting for us. And as we've all come here this morning, we're pulling up our chairs to this biblical table, this table of worship, this table of giving, this table of communion, and we don't have to strive and strain to feed ourselves. We have a high and holy father who is going to feed us. He's going to fill us to the full this morning, and I feel a little quickened. 
I'm a little quieted. I feel a little electric. I always feel this way right before I go back to the Holy Land. Israel feels like home for me, but I want to just thank you for welcoming me and letting me be part of your home this morning as part of Church of the City. We are finishing out our Fame and Deeds series today, so I want to begin with this sort of creedal text for us as Church of the City in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 2. It says this, Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them in our day, in our time. Make them known in wrath. Remember mercy. Something I tell my students all the time at the college, that the first step in Bible study is never to read the Bible. The first step in Bible study is always to pray. It's to humble ourselves and to posture ourselves to be fed. So I just want to invite you to bow your heads quickly and to imagine yourself leaning back, looking up, opening wide your mouth, asking the living God to fill you to the full, to teach, to show, to illuminate things for you that no man or woman could. We posture ourselves as sons and daughters this morning. Father God, Lord, here we are, another Sunday morning. And Lord, it is Sabbath because of you. Lord, we are able to rest in the deepest points and places of our hearts and our lives because you are doing the work. Lord, when we went to sleep last night, you do not sleep and you do not slumber. You were working, bringing salvation, redemption, restoration in the night. Lord, we woke up into your beautiful work this morning. The bringing of shalom, the bringing of harmony, of fullness, of delight. And Lord, we do sit in this moment and we do ask for your fame and for your deeds to be made new in our day and in our generation. Lord, we want to see you, we want to know you, we want to make you known. Lord, would you twice bless our time in the word today? Would you fill us to the full? I pray that when we walk out of this place, we'll be able to look at each other and say, it was good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Lord, you are good, and what you do is good. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, our primary text today is in Acts 3. It's probably a story that you've read before. It's somewhat familiar to us, but I actually want to go back to Acts 2. Part of what we're going to see today in the rabbinics, Acts 2 and Acts 3 are married. They're like two pearls that you want to string together. There's cohesion, there's unity, um, there's flow to it. So before we get into Acts 3, if you could go in your minds and your hearts back to Acts 2 for me, this event that we call Pentecost, the birth of the church. I believe Jake preached on this a few weeks ago in the series when the Holy Spirit descended, came down in flames and tongues of fire and sat on the believers in Jerusalem. Can you imagine if you had been there? You're in Jerusalem, all of a sudden this earth-shattering, ground-breaking, kingdom-coming inauguration of a new era, a new thing that God is doing can you imagine if you were there? Sometimes I wonder, what did those tongues of fire look like as they were coming down? And the Bible says they rested on the believers. And the church was birthed. It was this beautiful moment, this thing that even us, 2,000 years later, we look back and we're like, man, what would that have been like? And yet, the thing that I've been thinking as I was preparing this teaching is every single one of them who experienced that extraordinary moment, they all got up the next morning and went to work. How do you experience Pentecost and then wake up the next morning and just go back to baking your bread or back to being a fisherman, back to being a rabbi? Back to being a mother. How in the world do you go from such extraordinary back to what seems like the ordinary? I want to show you this quote. I came across this this past December. Our culture knows how to anticipate an event, but we don't know how to sustain it. 
Um, how many of you here love Christmas? Raise your hand if you love Christmas. I love Christmas. I'm one of those weird people. I actually listen to Christmas music year round. It'll be 95 degrees in June and I'm listening to Winter Wonderland and somehow that works for me. It's, I can still connect to that. I love Christmas music. I love the theology in Christmas music and I love Christmas. And we have this way of anticipating Christmas the day after Thanksgiving. We're all excited. The trees go up. We start our shopping. It's Christmas parties. Who's got like one or maybe more ugly Christmas sweaters that you just pull out for some parties? I see a lot of you nodding. And we love this Christmas season. And then December 24th comes. It's Christmas Eve. You're with family and friends. You wake up the next day. It's Christmas Day. And we enjoy it. And I don't know about you, but I usually wake up on December 26th and I feel sad. Does anybody here feel sad the day after Christmas? It's like, where did it go? How do we get like a all year, every year, every day kind of a Christmas? Because we feel like something that was beautiful is gone. It's just gone again. We know how to anticipate an event, but as a culture, we don't often know how to sustain it. How would you have experienced Pentecost and then in any meaningful way sustained it? When you woke up the next morning, when you went back to your life, and when we look at Pentecost, when I say it was earth-shattering, the inauguration of a new thing, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit is present. He's moving. He's doing. But it's different after Pentecost. Before Acts 2, the Bible shows us and tells us that the Holy Spirit would come upon a person at a specific time for a specific purpose at a specific place. So the Spirit would come almost like a visitation. We call the Old Testament era the era of visitation because the Spirit of God would visit and do a work and then would ascend back. At Pentecost, that changed forever because when those flames of fire, when those tongues of fire came down, they stayed down. They were planted, embedded in the believers and now from Acts 2 forward, we are now living in what we call the era of inhabitation. The Spirit of God living 24-7, indwelling, filling, fueling the life of every single believer. How many of you are really grateful you live in the era of inhabitation? I love this. I thanked God again, even this morning as I was going through my notes, as I was looking at this. And when we talk about what kind of flame was it, you know, when we get past if you could have been present at Pentecost, but that flame, what's so interesting is the Apostle Paul tells us in another book of the Bible, we're getting ready to look at it, that that flame, that tongue of fire that came down and rested and now lives in every believer, that it carries the same exact power that God used when he raised Jesus from the dead. I don't even know what to do with that, to be completely honest. I want to show this to you. It's in Ephesians chapter 1. It's verses 18 and 20. Paul is writing to the believers at Ephesus about the Spirit of God in us. And he says this, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. I love that word exerted. Say that word with me, exerted. It's this idea that the muscle, the very muscle, the flexing of God the Father when he raised Jesus from the dead, that same power, that same exertion, that same flexing is now at work in your life and in my life 24-7. Y'all have heard me say this before. I have a little bit of issue with road rage. Appreciate you praying for me this morning, Pastor Jake. And sometimes when people are getting on my nerves in traffic in downtown Franklin, I will say this to myself, Christy, the power of the resurrection is in you. You don't have to lose your mind right now. 
you can make a good choice by the spirit of God, the power of the resurrection can get you through this moment. I don't know what some of your vices are, some of the things that tend to trip you up, some of your points of temptation, but the Bible is answering that moment for you fully and finally. That the Holy Spirit does not visit you. He's living inside of you. 24-7. You, as a believer, will never again know a moment without the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Y'all, that is good news. You know, I am in touch with that part of me that's a wreck, that's broken, fractured, being healed, but I'm not all the way there. How many of you feel like God's doing a work in your life, but you're just not all the way there? You know, we're in process, this sanctification. It is such good news when we look at this. In part, as we get ready to head to our text today, what I love about this idea of this flame now living inside of us 24-7 with the power of the resurrection in it is that when we talk about the fame and deeds of God, they are possible at any time. We no longer wait for a certain day or a holiday on our calendar. We're no longer looking for a certain feast or festival or moment. The fame and deeds of God can visit us any time, any day. It could be a Monday. It could be a Thursday. It could be a Saturday. It doesn't matter. And it invites us to live in this way of expectancy. So I want us now to go to Acts 3. I told you we're going to kind of marry Acts 2 and 3 together today. We're headed some places. But what I love is Acts 2 has happened. Pentecost, the tongues of fire have come, now resting in the believers. And what comes right after Acts 2 is Acts 3 in the Bible. And as we pick up our storyline today, what I love is this is a story about two men Peter and John, who experienced Pentecost in Acts 2 and then just got up another day, someday, a day, one day, they're going about their normal, average, everyday lives, and the fame and deeds of God shows up. So if you're with me, say okay. okay. As we come to Acts 3, as we begin just to bite on this and to work our way through it, the Bible says in Acts 3, 1 and 2, one day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at what time? Three at 3 in the afternoon. Now a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful where he was put every day to beg from those going in to the temple courts. Now stop and pause. Um, I find his friends to be very smart because whoever they are, they kind of understand that if you have a friend who's lame and he needs to beg for money, it's a really good idea to put him in front of the gate beautiful at the temple because who do you expect to give you money but the kind of people going to temple? It's kind of like if we're driving to church one morning and you see a family stranded on the side of the road, there's something in you that goes, I probably should pull over and help this family because I'm on my way to church. If I'm the kind of person going to church, I should probably be the kind of person to stop and help this family. So this man is very strategically placed, and it's just one day, someday after that, I want to show you a picture of the modern Temple Mount. This is obviously in Jerusalem, the city on a hill, and historians give us two possible locations for our story today for the gate beautiful. This is why I brought my laser pointer this morning. So you see the Temple Mount right here. In Jesus' day, this large platform, it's about the size of 25 or 26 football fields. It was the largest man-made structure in the world in Jesus' day. This is the temple where Herod's temple would have stood that Jesus would have come to. And the gate beautiful, there's two possible locations. One is that would have been located right through here on the eastern side. We're looking from the Mount of Olives across the Kidron Valley. There's another possible location here along the southern entrance. There were some gates here called the Holda Gates. Holda was a prophetess. And uh, some scholars believe that the Holda Gates was the gate beautiful. Some anchor it at that eastern flank that I just showed you. And the only reason I show you this picture this morning is because this story that we are reading, it happened. 
The Bible is not fiction. These things happened. Acts 2 happened. Acts 3 happened, and it happened somewhere right there. Whether it's the eastern side or the southern side, these things are real, and God is still doing these things today. So as we continue through our story, Acts 3, verses 4 and 5 say this. Peter looked straight at him, as did John, being the lame man. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Now talk about getting more than you asked for. He is asking for money because this is all he knows, but the fame and deeds of God are about to show up because we're now in the era of the flame. We're in the era of that every day, the fame and deeds, every day, the power of the resurrection at work in the people of God. You know, a few months back, I went to Starbucks one day, speaking of you never know what's going to happen, and I go through the drive through and I order my coffee, and for me, that's a tall, dark, with room for cream, and I get up to the window, and the lady goes, oh, um, the car in front of you paid for your drink. And I thought, oh, that's sweet. You know, I think that's a thing that people actually do at Starbucks. And so I got all inspired and fired up. And I said, you know what? I want to pay it forward. I want to pay for the person behind me. Now, people, before you do this, look in your rearview mirror. Because <laughs> generosity needs to be measured and known. I looked in my rearview mirror, and it was this huge van with like eight people in it. I mean, maybe a family of eight or a bunch of friends going somewhere, but there were a lot of them in it. And you, you just know where this story is going. Every single one of them ordered something to drink and every single one of them ordered food. And the lady looks at me and she goes, oh my gosh, you're so sweet. That'll be $47. <laughs> it was the most expensive cup of coffee I've ever bought in my life. Somebody treated me to two, I end up paying 47. It's like you never know what's going to happen in a given day. This man, he has no idea of what's about to happen, but he's now living in the air of inhabitation and the fame and deeds of God can happen anytime, anywhere, as God wills. It's a beautiful hope. It's a beautiful reality. So we follow through in our story, Acts chapter 3, verses 6 through 10. Our story continues. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. And when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. I love those two words, wonder and amazement. When was the last time God did something in your life and you felt wonder and amazement? This was the people's response to the fame and deeds of God showing up on behalf of this man at the gate beautiful 2,000 years ago. You know, in Matthew 28, we know this passage, we call it the Great Commission. It's Jesus' final words to his disciples, and in our English Bibles, it says, Go ye therefore, how many of you say ye every day? Go ye therefore into all the earth making disciples. But in the original Greek, the sentence actually reads what Jesus is actually saying in this moment is, as you go, make disciples. It's not like you have to go somewhere where you're not currently. It's just as you wake up tomorrow morning, as I wake up, as we go throughout our lives, make disciples. Peter and John didn't see this moment coming any more than the lame man. They just got up and were going about their normal, average, every day in the fame and deeds of God. They showed up. You know, one of the most powerful witnesses in the world is a changed life. It's a before and an after. It's a person in process by the grace of God receiving salvation, receiving their redemption, receiving restoration. You know, I live in Franklin. I'm in a subdivision called Fieldstone Farms, and the house right next to me, it's a rental. 
And so what that means is about every two or three years, different families are moving in and out. I'm an extrovert, um, so I love meeting new people, so I'm always going over to meet my neighbors. And a few years back, one day I was sitting there, and a moving truck pulled up, and a guy got out, and he was by himself, and I thought, he's going to be my neighbor. I want to go over and meet him, so I walk outside, and I introduce myself, and the first thing I noticed is he had a British accent. How many of you love an accent? I feel like people with an accent, what they're saying, it's actually truer, just because of how it sounds coming out of their mouth. I'm like, that's true. What you're saying is true. You sound awesome. And I noticed he had this British accent, and you know how we do here in the West. When you, need a, when you meet a new person, it's two questions. What is your name, and what do you do? And so here come the questions. He asked, oh, what is your name, and what do you do? And I said, well, my name is Christy, and at the time I was on staff at a church and teaching Bible at a Christian college, so it's kind of hard for me to be an undercover Christian. You at least assume I'm a Christian when you hear what I do. And when I told him this, when I said, I'm on staff at a church, I teach Bible at a Christian college, he had this visceral reaction like I was an alien. And I thought, uh-oh, he didn't like that answer. And he went on to tell me that he is an atheist. He doesn't believe in God. He thinks that people who believe in God are just believing in fairy tales and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, okay, well, bless the Lord. I'm glad we're going to be neighbors. Can I help you move in? And um, so over time, because I'm a two on the Enneagram, y'all, and so you loving me is very important to me. I'm all about just trying to be loved. And so I would try to meet him at the mailbox. I'm trying to win him over. I'm trying to have conversations. And he doesn't like me. I mean, he's just always, I mean, he was just making it very clear. He had no intentions of really talking to me or, or being a neighborly neighbor. Um, but I just kept trying, and I just kept trying. And you could never tell another person's story. Um, but let's just say when you're literally a person's neighbor, you can somewhat see some of their rhythms, some of their practices, some of the way that they're living their life. And I could just tell that his life was outside of the shalom of God. It was just outside of peace, just outside of harmony. A um, lot of destruction there, a lot of things going on. And one night I was sitting on my front porch while Chester was running around, and he pulled in, he came home. And I was just sitting there, it was nighttime, and he opens his car door, and he's getting out, and I could just see it all over his posture. He was slumped. He just looked sad. He shut his car door, and he looked over, and he saw me. And then he did something that shocked me. He walked over to me and sat down on the bench beside me. And he didn't even look over at me. He was still just looking out. And all of a sudden, my heart started beating. I was like, oh, shoot, I'm supposed to say something about Jesus right now. <laughs> like, this is one of those moments, right? And I remember just looking over at him, and I just said, man, is it working for you? Is your life working for you? How are you doing? And he looked right at me, and he said, no, it is not working for me. It's one of the holiest moments I've ever been a part of in my whole life. And for the next hour, we sat on that front bench. And I just started sharing with him about my story, how in losing my father, I was a wreck things, decisions I made during that time that bankrupted me, bankrupted others, how the living God had to come get me and began restoring me. And the interesting thing is, in that moment, I'm not giving him a bunch of Bible verses. I'm not talking to him about creeds or calendars. I kept talking to him about a man, a man named Jesus, who can change his life from the inside out. And I wish I could tell you in that moment that, you know, angels came down out of heaven and he had a miraculous conversion and I took him inside and baptized him in my bathtub and, <laughs> you know, now he's a mega pastor of some huge church in San Antonio, you know, 20,000 people. It's like the fish story, it always gets bigger. And nothing really happened that night. He listened after about an hour. He goes, well, I'm tired. I think I'm just going to go in. And about three months later, he moved. 
It's been years. I've never seen him since. I still pray for him, pray for him with me. I don't know where he is. I don't know where life has taken him. But I know this, the fame and deeds of God, the story of possible salvation and redemption was made known to him that night. He didn't see it coming. I didn't see it coming. We both sort of just found ourselves in this moment. Do you live as a person expectant that at any given moment, on any given day, the fame and deeds of God could show up in you and through you to others? This is now the era that we're living in. You know, I want to invite the worship host to come up and to begin sharing communion, but I want to marry Acts 2 and 3 for you. The Bible gives us no detail for nothing. And in Acts chapter 3, the story that we just read, the Bible actually tells us what time Peter and John were going to the temple. What time were they going? At 3 in the afternoon. So I want you to hold that 3 p.m. Does anyone remember from Acts 2 what time Pentecost happened? The Bible says it happened at 9 a.m. We know that because when the tongues of fire came down and the believers started speaking in other known tongues, some people standing there thought they were drunk. And Peter says to them, we're not drunk. It's only 9 in the morning. So Acts 2, Pentecost happens at 9 a.m. Acts 3, Peter and John are going to the temple at 3 p.m. So what is up with 9 a.m.? And 3 p.m. in the first century world of Jesus, Peter, and John. These were very important daily times. I have a slide here for you. There was something in Judaism known as the Tamid sacrifices. Everybody say that with me. The Tamid sacrifices. Two daily. The morning sacrifice was at 9 a.m. The evening sacrifice was at 3 p.m. And these are the two times a day when the lambs of Israel are being slain for the nation. 9 a.m. the morning sacrifice, 3 p.m. the afternoon sacrifice. Now where the pearls get strung together, I love this Acts 2, this Acts 3, 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. Is the Bible tells us that Jesus went on the cross at 9 a.m. While the lambs of Israel are being slain, the Lamb of God takes his place on the cross and begins paying for your sins and for mine. And the Bible also tells us that it was at 3 p.m. at the time of the evening sacrifice that Jesus cries out in a loud voice, it is finished. It's the Lamb of God. Jesus fulfilling the morning sacrifice and the evening sacrifice. The word tamid in Hebrew, it carries the idea of continual or perpetual. All they knew was this necessity to sacrifice daily because no final sacrifice had ever come about. And we see Jesus so fully in this moment of a 9 a.m. and a 3 p.m., the work of your salvation is done. It is done because of who Jesus is. He took the cross for you at 9 a.m. He died on the cross for you at 3 p.m. There is now no need for future sacrifices. It is finished. We live in an extraordinary time, the era of inhabitation, when the fame and deeds of God can show up at any time. You will never again have an absolutely ordinary day. The Spirit of God at work and at play in our lives. And as we get ready to transition into communion, I have a slide with those three final words of Jesus. It is finished. And I just want to invite you to look at those words. And I just want you to hold your communion elements in your hand. Just to feel this. 
my prayer is that you and I again and anew right now would hear Jesus saying these three words to us. It is finished. It is finished. It is finished. We can rest in every possible and imaginable way because he is doing the work. 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. accomplished for you. Once for all, forever. The fame and deeds of God are still coming. They will be ever coming until we're in the kingdom fully realized and then we'll see them in a new and a more complete way. But for today, we want to remember Jesus of Nazareth who is still calling the lame to walk, who is still seeing to it that the deaf can hear, who is still seeing to it that the blind can see, who is still taking dead things and resurrecting them to new life. Those hands are upon you. Those hands are doing a work right now that only he can do. Let him do it. Let God do his work in your life. As we take the bread, the Bible says that on that final night, as he ate with his disciples, he took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given for you. Whenever you eat this, do it in remembrance of me. Let's remember Jesus today by eating. And at that same supper, the Bible says that Jesus took the cup. He said, this is the cup of my blood shed for you, the blood of a new covenant. When you drink this, drink it in remembrance of me. Let's remember Jesus today, together as we drink. I want to invite you to stand. We want to go out singing today. My prayer is that we are renewed in our hope, in our expectancy, and even in our active prayers, that the fame and deeds would be made known in our day and in our generation. They have their stories, we have ours. Let's sing together. And I believe I see you do it again You made a way Where there was no way And I believe I see you do it again I've seen you move You move the mountains And I believe I see you do it again you made a way where there was no way and i believe i see you do it again i've seen you move you move the mountains and i believe i see you do it again you made a way where there was no way and i believe I've seen you, I've seen you move, you move the mountains, and I believe, I see you do it again, you made a way, where there was no way, and I believe, I see you do it again, I see you do it One more time, let's sing, I've seen you move. I've seen you move, you move the mountains, and I believe I see you do it again. You made a way where there was no way, and I believe I 
see you do it again. I see you do it again. See you do it again. Sing one more time. I've seen you move. I've seen you move, you move the mountains, and I believe, I see you do it again. You made a way where there was no way, and I believe, I see you do it again. Uh, we'll be praying for you while you lead this new team uh, to Israel. We're always so blessed when you come. So thank you for bringing that to us uh, today. If you'd like to meet Christy, thank her personally, you can uh, come and do that right after the service. Well, that wraps up our Fame and Deeds series. We're starting a brand new series next week called Last Words. And we're going to be doing a study of the seven final statements that Jesus made on the cross before he passed away. It's going to take us all the way through uh, Easter. So that begins next week. The only other thing I want to say is, I forgot to say this um, at the top of the service, but if you'd like to become a family member here, like really move to the center of this place that we're trying to form together, uh, the next stakeholders course is going to be on March the 24th, and uh, you can just go to the website, churchofthecity.com forward slash Sylvan and click events to RSVP for that. Uh, or uh, you can do that on the app, the Church of the City app that you can get from the app store. And, um, and if you just even want to explore that, that's your next step. Come to that stakeholders course. Grace and peace. We'll see you next week as we start a brand new series. Thanks, guys.